Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about one of the more controversial countries in the Second World War, Sweden. Now, sure, Germany may have been a bit more controversial in how the word is often used to just describe something as bad but sound a bit more intellectual when you say it, but Sweden in World War II truly was controversial in the actual sense due to its position in the war and how it utilized that position, which we'll talk a bit more about later. When the war began on September 1st, 1939, Sweden would immediately declare itself to be a neutral country. Prime Minister Per Albin Hansen would say in his declaration that Sweden looked on no one as their enemy and that there was no plan in the thoughts of our people for aggression against any other country. This statement of neutrality was likely less out of ideological conviction. Hansen himself was a social democrat, and the German government didn't have the best relationship with social democrats or those on the left, to put it very mildly. But this statement was more out of necessity and reality. The fact of the matter was that if push came to shove, if Sweden were forced to join the war, they would be woefully unprepared. Three years prior to the war in 1936, Sweden began ramping up their military expenditures multiple times over in preparation for a major war they believed to be coming, and they would be right. In 36, their military spending was a whopping $37 million US, at least as far as I could find. Compare that to somewhere like the United States the same year, who spent somewhere between $500 million and $1 billion. Of course, America was much bigger, but you get the point. Sweden's military was incredibly small, and if Germany or the Soviet Union, their two biggest fears here, decided to attack, they would be in serious trouble if they didn't ramp up their spending and production. At their peak, Sweden would raise its defense spending to just over half a billion dollars in 1942, over ten times what they were spending just six years prior. How much that would have actually mattered, though, is kind of questionable, because when the war began, Sweden only really had a few dozen tanks, a few hundred planes, and an entire military numbering just 400,000 strong, which sounds large until you compare it to Germany and the Soviet Union, the country Sweden was worried about. In the short term, to help bolster their military and their air force for our purposes today, they would look outward, purchasing comparatively outdated aircraft from the likes of Italy, Britain, and the United States with planes like the CR-42, Gladiator, and P-35 all being sold to Sweden, numbering in the several dozens each. Of course, with each of these planes being both old and few in number, Sweden would still need to internally produce aircraft if it was even going to have the slightest chance of defending itself. The plane we're talking about today is one of those aircraft a rather unconventional design for when it was first envisioned, although the design would be a bit more popular a few years later. This was their attempt at making an advanced fighter that could help keep Sweden neutral with the threat of them having a solid, if small, military force. This is the Saab J-21. Its story begins for a brief moment in the late 1930s, possibly 1939. Sweden was now in the process of ramping up their military spending, now reaching $322 million US, as most of the Swedish fighters were outdated dregs from other countries, Saab, founded in 1937, began looking into developing a new, homegrown Swedish fighter. Looking into a plethora of fighter designs, some normal, some unconventional, the company began leaning towards the more unconventional design that was seldom seen in the Second World War. 
Instead of your standard monoplane fighter with propeller at the nose, Saab was seriously considering a twin-boom pusher design. While not as tried and true as your standard design, the pusher configuration did have some advantages that would make it enticing. Having no propeller in the nose gave the pilot much better forward visibility, and it gave them the ability to concentrate firepower in the nose. This type of design also had downsides that kept it from being all that popular, largely because of the placement of the propeller creating issues. If the pilot had to bail out, for example, the propeller being behind him was incredibly dangerous. The plane would continue moving forward, and the pilot would be at severe risk of running into it. Additionally, when the plane was on the ground, having the pusher prop meant that the plane needed a tricycle landing gear configuration that kept the tail off the ground, an added layer of needed construction that a lot of countries didn't really want to deal with. Still, these downsides were workable, but Saab would have to wait about two years until they could figure out how to work around them. Because of Germany's invasion of Poland, the potential war Sweden was worried about in 1936 became reality. Both the Soviet Union and Germany teamed up to take on a neighboring country. Britain and France declared war in turn. Sweden only being separated from Germany and the Soviet Union by the Baltic Sea knew that they could potentially be on the chopping block next. Germany would formulate a plan to invade Sweden if needed, and Russia probably didn't. There isn't any info that says they did, but considering that they tried to invade Finland later in 1939, this was probably a bit of a red flag to Sweden and the Swedish government. As the threat of war grew ever closer, Sweden desperately needed to build up its military however it could which meant that Saab would begin focusing on light and medium bombers for the next couple years, producing a licensed version of the German Junkers Ju-86 and their very own Saab B-17 dive bomber slash reconnaissance aircraft. Two years later, in 1941, work on the J-21 would continue. While I could not find the exact reason as to why, I do suspect that it had to do with the German invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22nd. In that invasion, Germany requested that Sweden allow Germany to move troops through Sweden and into Finland. As after the attempted Soviet invasion of Finland, Finland looked to Germany for assistance. Germany wanted to invade the Soviet Union, and Finland wanted to take some territory back from the Soviets. They had a common goal at this time. Regardless, Sweden would allow Germany to move troops through Sweden into Finland, one of the very controversial moves they made. If I had to speculate, Sweden doing this gave them a sense of security for the time being. The two countries they feared attacks from the most, Germany and the Soviet Union, were now locked in battle against each other. Sweden may have been able to relax a bit, not having to fear invasion, while their two biggest threats were very much preoccupied. Thus, work could continue on the J-21, and by mid-1943, the first prototype was ready to fly, built with Swedish materials, Western European weapons, and German engines. Measuring in at 10.45 meters long, 11.6 meters wide, and 3.97 meters tall, the J-21 was a pretty standard design, dimensionally speaking. Initially, the J-21 was designed around the British-made Bristol Taurus engine, a 14-cylinder radial engine. However, by 1943, the Taurus and its 1,130 horsepower, at best, would not be enough to propel the 9,000-plus pound J-21 to speeds that would make it remotely viable in today's world. Fighters at this time were a good deal faster than they were back in 1939, 
so a more powerful engine was needed. It was eventually decided that the new engine would be the German-designed Daimler-Benz DB605, with around 1,500 horsepower. However, when Germany began providing some DB605 models in mid-1942, Sweden may have started regretting this decision. The engines they received often had issues. Some of the quote-unquote brand new engines they received didn't work properly, either the result of poor quality control or intentional sabotage from concentration camp laborers. Daimler-Benz did benefit from slave labor during the time. Some of the other engines they received were simply in poor condition, likely the result of Germany not wanting to give their good engines to Sweden, so they gave them the leftover crappy engines. This led to some growing pains with the J21, but once the engines were fixed and working properly, they gave the J21 solid flight performance overall. Its top speed would sit at a pretty comfortable 400 miles an hour. Comparatively not amazing when you look at some other aircraft being tested around the same time, but still significantly better than what Sweden had, and it would be at least similar to what Allied and Axis countries had at the same time. Also at least similar was the proposed firepower of the J-21 which was probably equal, if not better, than a lot of other fighters. There would be five guns in total, three in the nose and two in the wings. There was a 20mm cannon based off the French-made HS-404 and four 13.2mm machine guns based off a Belgian-made upgrade of the Browning 50 Cal. With 60 cannon rounds and 300 plus rounds per machine gun, the J-21 was quite well armed. In a later variant of the J-21, the J-21A3, an attack variant, the ability to carry 700 kilos of bombs or other ordnance was added. This would reduce the top speed down to 350 miles an hour, but gave it the ability to carry rockets, bombs, or even napalm carrying drop tanks. In the air, the performance of the J-21 was pretty solid, but it did have a few notable issues. For one, the DB-605 engines they were using had some problems with decreasing performance at higher altitudes. So if Sweden were being attacked by, say, a high-altitude bomber, this would pose an issue. Additionally, because of how the cockpit was designed, with that pill shape and the propeller behind it, the pilot had poor visibility to his rear. Also, the controls were found to be quite heavy and overall exhausting for the pilot on longer flights. On the plus side, though, in the early stages of J-21 testing, in early 1944, Something that would solve the issue of the pusher prop being dangerous to the pilot would be tested on the Swedish Saab 17. This was an ejector seat. Testing on the J-21 continued throughout 1944 and deep into 1945. So deep, in fact, that the war ended before the first production models of the J-21 were delivered, on December 1st, 1945. So, even though the J-21 was designed and pushed out of a need for a fighter aircraft that could defend Sweden in World War II, it would only be adopted after the war ended. Regardless, the J-21 would be produced between 1945 and 1949, with 298 of them being made in total. None of them would serve in combat, though. That wouldn't be the end of the J-21, though, as in 1945, Sweden sought to keep pace with other major Allied powers and wanted to test jet engine technology. They would manage to secure a license to produce the British-designed de Havilland Goblin II, and to test out a jet-powered aircraft Saab elected to mount the J-21 with the Goblin II. To sufficiently mount the jet engine, though, 
significant modifications to the J-21 were required. Most importantly, the fuel capacity had to be increased substantially, so the wings would be outfitted with internal fuel storage, and the wingtips were given optional teardrop-shaped tanks. The maximum fuel capacity of the jet-powered variant would be 450 U.S. gallons. Additionally, the tail boom had to be raised to keep it out of line of the jet thruster, some air brakes were installed to the wings, and the ejector seat was given greater propulsion. Sweden would begin altering a handful of J-21 frames in 1947, and these new units would be given the designation of J-21R. The performance of the J-21R would be about 25% greater than that of the J-21, at least from a speed perspective, going from a top speed of 400 miles an hour to 500 miles an hour. These models would ideally serve the same role as the ground attack versions of the J-21, being outfitted with the same weaponry at a baseline, with the ability to carry bombs, rockets, and even some extra gun pods. Initially, some 124 aircraft were ordered, but sometime in or after 1948, the order was reduced down to just 64. An initial run of 34 were made in 1950, and a second run of 30 that had improved engines was produced between 1950 and 52. The initial run models only lasted three years before they were retired, and the second run models lasted a few years longer, being retired in 1956. The reason for their short careers was twofold. For one, Sweden would begin purchasing British-made de Havilland vampire fighters sometime in 1946 a plane with a design remarkably similar to the J-21 and J-21R. Sweden would end up purchasing hundreds of these, and their performance was just a little bit better than the J-21R. Additionally, in 1948, Sweden successfully flew the Saab 29, a more modern-looking jet fighter design powered by a Swedish variant of the de Havilland Ghost engine. This fighter had a top speed upwards of 660 miles an hour, over 100 miles an hour more than the J-21R. So, after the Saab 29 successfully flew, and its production began the same year, there was no real reason to continue major work into the J-21R. Some 661 Saab 29s would be made, and it would serve in the Swedish Air Force up into the mid-70s. Ultimately, while not long-lived nor produced in significant numbers, the Saab J-21 and 21R serve as a pretty interesting story, from a country seldom thought about in World War II doing whatever it could to ensure it wouldn't be invaded, from being rather controversial in providing passage to German troops and providing vital ore to Germany, to also taking in Jewish refugees and saving them from persecution, Sweden sought neutrality and peace. Still, if push came to shove, they needed something, anything at all, that could compare to then-modern fighters, possessed by the likes of Germany and the Soviet Union. In the end, because of their neutrality and their appeasing of both sides, they never had to use planes like the J-21, so there was comparatively little urgency in their development and production. But they still managed to be pretty decent and unique planes, with the twin boom pusher prop and the ejector seat. Now, I'll be completely honest, I couldn't think of a transition to end the video, so how about a fun fact about Sweden's own IKEA? It was actually founded during World War II, on July 28, 1943, as a mail-order sales business. To think, while in the midst of global conflict, one man decided to make a company that would put Billy bookcases in the dorm rooms of every college student on the globe. What a visionary.
All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know, the last time I went to Ikea, all the prices were like twice as much as they were a few years ago. I have a Billy bookcase, and I think I paid $60 for it. And right now, the exact same one is $120. It's a decent shelving unit, but not $120 nice. Ikea needs to fix their prices. Their stuff's supposed to be cheap. Anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.